Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Noble, and today we're going to talk about some of the new technologies in uh, relating to photography and cinematography. And some of these technologies are, they're just like unbelievable. They have, in the last 10, 15 years, we could not even have dreamt of where we are today. And so we're going to talk about some things like drones and smartphones and action cameras. And I'm going to do what I often do in lectures, and that is I tell stories with videos and with photography. And I'm going to tell you a rather amazing story right now. Um, one day, maybe seven years ago, six years ago, I was sitting in my living room, and I was watching a documentary on TV, and I was watching a documentary on the Great Wall of China. And I've been many places in the world. I've seen a lot of amazing things, but I had never been to the Great Wall of China. And I started to think to myself, well, what would it be like? How would it feel to stand on the Great Wall of China? And so as this daydream of mine began to unfold, I began to think of other places in the world that I would also like to see. And so in my daydream of this fictitious trip, I added in a few places like the Galapagos Islands and Machu Picchu, uh, Iguazu Falls, which we, uh, some of you may have in your very near future here, uh, the Great Pyramids of Egypt, Taj Mahal, the amazing uh, ancient ruins of Angkor Wat, and while I'm fantasizing, why not throw in a few African safaris while we're at it? And I started thinking to myself, you know, life is sometimes very short. Why just daydream about these amazing destinations? Why not just go? And better yet, why not do it all in one trip? So it was essentially the entire bucket list every amazing place on the planet that I could think of is what I elected to do in this amazing journey. Now, prior to going on this trip, I attended a conference down in Las Vegas, and it's called the CES Conference, which is the, uh, it's where all the nerds in the world get together and they look at all the newest technologies, everything that's brand new and, and is coming out. And I saw over in a corner somewhere, this big net. And the net was really more like a cage than a net. And inside of this cage was this flying device called a drone. Now, back in 2014, I had never seen a drone before. And they were pretty much uh, brand new, and not too many people had them. And I saw on this drone on the bottom of the drone was mounted a camera. And further, the operator of the drone could look on his monitor and see what the camera was seeing as it was flying. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's the, the possibilities that this opens up to the creative photographer are just amazing. This is a, an interesting uh, example of that, this is a place uh, called Julia Pfeiffer State Park in California. And I've often thought, you know, if I could get my camera over there or up that high or at this different perspective or angle, my photo would be so much nicer. And that is essentially what a drone allows you to do. You can place that camera anywhere, essentially, that you would like to place that camera. And so while I was at this CES conference, I was talking to the representative of DJI, which is the company that made these instruments, and uh, we started talking about photography and what have you, and I told him about my upcoming trip around the world, and he says, oh, well, that's, that's pretty interesting. Would you like to take a drone with you? We would be interested in sponsoring you. And I tried to uh, conceal my excitement, and, but I didn't do a very good job of it. And I said, yes, that would be delightful. Let's, <laughs> let's do that. And so uh, perhaps unofficially, I was probably the very first person in the world to travel around the world with a drone. 
And it, uh, the experiences that I had with this drone are amazing. You're going to see some of those today and see some of the actual footage shot with this drone. Now, this was the original uh, drone that uh, came out. It was called the Phantom 1. And it was amazing even in that day. Uh, but the, it, the pilot required a reasonable degree of skill to pilot the drone. Today, and I kid you not, any one of you in this audience today, I could hand the controls to a drone and you could fly it. Up, down, left, right, it would be a piece of cake. They're, they're really just amazing uh, today. So I started off on this uh, world trip, and of course I went to the crown jewel uh, first. I went to Machu Picchu, and from there over to the Galapagos Islands, from the Galapagos Islands over to Iguazu Falls, Rio de Janeiro, up to Salvador, Brazil, down to Sao Paulo, across over to Victoria Falls. So in this one trip, I visited perhaps the two most beautiful waterfalls on the planet. In fact, uh, I won't tell the story today, but Victoria Falls was an instrumental moment in my life when I was about 20. I managed to get over to see Victoria Falls, and it's, it's just this magnificent place. If you have an opportunity to do that at some point in your life, I highly encourage you to do that. From Victoria Falls, I went to a penguin colony uh, down in Cape Town. I did three safaris in Africa, one in South Africa, uh, two in Tanzania, one in Serengeti, uh, in the Terengeti Safari, and perhaps the creme de la creme of safaris, which is the Nguro Nguro Crater uh, Safari, which is this enormous 100-mile diameter uh, ancient extinct volcano, volcanic crater that uh, animals are not trapped in, but the concentration of wildlife in there is truly spectacular. Not to be outdone by the safaris, I went up to the Great Pyramids of Egypt and then over to India where I spent a full month. Uh, India was a place I had read so much about in my youth. And I went to New Delhi and to uh, Hardwar and the Taj Mahal, uh, Vrindavan. I may show you a short clip of a, a, an absolutely amazing day in Vrindavan. Kolkata, uh, uh, Rishikesh, uh, Jaipur. From there over to Beijing, China, and to the Great Wall of China where my daydream initially began. And from there, back home. So it was, it was an amazing journey, and when I added up the days of my journey without planning it, it was around the world in 80 days, which is kind of a serendipitous number. Okay, I want to talk now about these drones and their amazing capabilities. And I'm going to demonstrate for you a skill that all, probably most of you could do, here I have just an umbrella, and I'm just going to balance it in the tips of my fingers. And to do that, it required my feet to be planted on the ground. It required my eyes to see this umbrella. It required a tactile sense in my fingertips. It required the input from my brain and the sensations of my hand to say, what direction do I need to move that umbrella uh, in order for it to stay upright? Now, how hard or difficult would it be to impart those skills to a machine? And you might imagine that, well, a machine doesn't have feet and a machine doesn't have eyes, and so it might be rather difficult to do that. If we could have the video sound up a little bit, please. You can notice that this quad is making fine adjustments to keep the pole balanced. How do we design the algorithms to do this? We added the mathematical model of the pole to that of the quad. Once we have a model of the combined quad-pole system, we can use control theory to create algorithms for controlling it. 
here you see that it's stable, and even if I give it little nudges, it goes back to the nice balanced position. We can also augment the model to include where we want the quad to be in space. Using this pointer made out of reflective markers, I can point to where I want the quad to be in space a fixed distance away from me. So using software and current technology, we were able to replicate many of those skills uh, into a machine. We're going to look at another example here. Notice how the quad lost altitude when I put this glass of water on it. Unlike the balancing pole, I did not include the mathematical model of the glass in the system. In fact, the system doesn't even know that the glass of water is there. Like before, I can use the pointer to tell the quad where I want to be in space. And that's why you don't need to model the glass. It naturally doesn't spill, no matter what the quad does. That's a trick I don't think I could do very well. OK, I'm going to do another demonstration of a skill. Uh, this is not terribly skillful to do, but if I take this ping pong ball, I can bounce it on this racket. And every time it bounces on the racket, I'm making fine-tuned decisions on where to place the racket, on what angle to place the racket. And it's difficult when we're dealing with a live, happening right now scenario to impart that to a machine because it's, it's instantaneous. Does anyone have the ability to throw a ping pong ball to me? I need a volunteer. It's real easy to do. Yes, sir. Anybody. Doesn't matter. I'll just have you stand right there. And I, you're going to throw it to me right around this paddle, and I'm going to pass it back to you. Let's do it one more time. There we go. All right, excellent. So this was a more, thank you very much, sir. This was a more complex uh, example because now we had to deal with a moving object in space and the calculations of where to place that paddle and the angle and the velocity to hit it just right so that it went back to the sender. This quad has a racket strapped onto its head with a sweet spot roughly the size of an apple, so not too large. The following calculations are made every 20 milliseconds or 50 times per second. We first figure out where the ball is going. We then next calculate how the quad should hit the ball so that it flies to where it was thrown from. Third, a trajectory is planned uh, that carries the quad from its current state to the impact point with the ball. Fourth, we only execute 20 milliseconds worth of that strategy. 20 milliseconds later, the whole process is repeated until the quad strikes the ball. Uh, the, the advancement in technology today is, is truly remarkable. Uh, does anybody out there own a Tesla car? No one in the audience? I happen to own a Tesla car. I bought my first Tesla back in 2015, and I have one of their newer versions today that has what's called uh, full self-driving capability. Now, this is still in a beta mode, meaning that it's not ready for general use yet. But literally, I can get into my car, and I can say, I want to go to Los Angeles. And let's say I'm in Las Vegas. And I can pre-program the route, and I can say, go. And it will do everything from stopping at stop signs to 
stopping at red lights to yielding to passerbys and dogs and traffic cones. And it's, it's truly amazing where our technology is going. That's a little bit of a deviation from what we're, we're talking about with drones, but there are a lot of similarities. Machines can not only perform dynamic maneuvers on their own, they can do it collectively. These three quads are cooperatively carrying a Skynet. <laughs> they perform an extremely dynamic and uh, collective maneuver to launch the ball back to me. Notice that at full extension, these quads are vertical. Now, you're all probably pretty fortunate because had, uh, had COVID not been high? Mm -hmm. with us today, I would be asking for three volunteers to come up and perform that, uh, that uh, three-person uh, technique. So this is a, uh, a short video. Uh, this is in uh, Salvador, Brazil. And this is one of the first times that I brought the drone out. And these earlier Very versions stable. of the drone are quite primitive in comparison to what uh, is available today. So I'm sending it up to see what's uh, of interest up there. Uh, so this is that, that peninsula that I was on. This is one of the scenes. And as a terrestrial photographer, I can take a photograph like this. But I'm very limited in what I can photograph because I'm on the ground. If, well, let's first say that this spot that you see, that's where that cannon was on, in that lighthouse area. And where those people are standing there, that's where I launched the drone from. And so <clears throat> now we're looking at the image that I would see on my monitor as I'm controlling the drone. I'm seeing what I'm pointing the camera at. And I have not only control of the drone to tell it where to go in space, but I have control of the drone to move the camera up and down and so forth. So I can now move the camera to a spot to get an image that I wanted to get. And here's one of the photos that I took of that uh, beautiful peninsula. And when I returned to my hotel, I showed uh, the owner of the hotel and a number of other people who I had met there this photo, and they were, they were just flabbergasted. They had no idea of the beauty of where they lived I that a photo like this uh, could exist because, again, this technology was brand new at the time. Here's another photo taken uh, <coughs> with a drone. This is a place called the Goosenecks in Utah. And again, many um, places like this can only truly be appreciated uh, from the air. Uh, anybody know where this is? Cypress Point in uh, Pebble Beach, California, one of the most beautiful golf courses in the world. This is a place called Monument Valley. And uh, uh, this is Meteor Crater. And this is bringing the drone back here. And I, in, I included this because uh, normally today I'll just bring it and I'll just say down and it comes straight down and it lands softly like a, a bird lighting onto a branch. But here it was going back and forth because, again, the technology was not terribly advanced in those days. So the drone that you see on the right there, those, that's the Phantom series. And the drone on the left, this is... Uh, some of the newer versions of the uh, DJI product, which is called uh, Mavic. And those arms you see on the Mavic drone all fold up into the body, so the profile is, is very demure. And uh, drones today have avoidance technology, meaning <coughs> I freely admit that many times in my early days, as a drone pilot that I crashed into branches and I crashed into other things. And uh, it's, it was a scary thing because it's not an inexpensive piece of equipment. I'm going to let this video uh, explain itself to you. 
The following video moment was a heart-pounding and terrifying experience for a drone pilot. I was hired to do some filming in Monument Valley, and this particular morning I was attempting to document a well-known attraction called the Totem Pole. You see the Totem Pole emerging on the right side of the screen. One of the perks of our filming was being granted permission to camp at the base of the Totem Pole so we could do a stellar time-lapse that evening. Here's our camp at the base of the totem pole. My objective was to do a slow pan of the rock formation in the early morning light. This is the beginning of the heart pounding moment. I start my pan moving to the left. I'm going to pause here to show you the location of our campsite relative to the drone's location. As I continue to fly the aircraft to the left, my transmission signal to the drone is lost due to the gigantic rock face between us. You will see a slight shudder in the video as the transmission signal is lost. The drone stops and sends me a signal lost message. Moments later, a return to home command is automatically initiated. I no longer have any control over the aircraft. The aircraft turns toward camp and makes a straight line back to its point of origin. I am horrified and helpless as I watch my drone heading straight for a million tons of solid rock wall. Make note of the drone's shadow as it approaches the rock face at high speed. Mere inches from impact with the rock wall and the complete destruction of the drone, the automatic avoidance sensors detect the rock face and bring the drone to a terrifying braking stop. At that moment, I regain control of the drone and send it straight up to clear the top of the rock wall. This was one of many exciting moments for a drone pilot. I don't think I had any blood left in my head when I was watching that drone fly at that rock face, knowing that I was completely helpless. I mean, my, my controls uh, were not functioning at the time. Um, so this is one of the uh, finished videos uh, that I shot at Monument Valley, and I'm going to show this to you. It's only a couple minutes long because it shows some of the capabilities of cinematography you can accomplish with these rather inexpensive drones. <laughs> It's called John Ford's Point. You may notice it from a number of different uh, westerns. All right, I'm pausing the video here just for a moment just to explain what you're looking at. You saw the totem pole in the, uh, in the video, a spire that rises hundreds and hundreds of feet from the floor of the canyon, and I sent the drone to the very top of the totem pole, and I pointed the camera straight down at the top of the totem pole, and I almost landed it. I didn't want to land it. Uh, but I got really darn close. You can see that I'm only a few feet from there. And I was surprised to see that there was a climbing harness uh, on the top there and what appears to be a grinding stone. Now, I have searched uh, the Internet to try to find out any information on this. I've failed to find any information, but I, I find that rather fascinating. And I'll bet you that there's only been uh, a handful, uh, a few dozen people maybe perhaps that have ever seen the top of this uh, a monument. Whoops. 
I may have to, oh, okay. I wish I had the capability to fast forward this, but I don't, so I apologize. There's a, there are a couple of maneuvers that are done with the drone. That, and I'm going to turn the sound down so I can speak as we're going over this portion. That uh, Actually, if, if up in the booth, if you could just lower the sound just for a moment. Thank you. Uh, so when I got to the top of the totem pole and the camera is pointing straight down at the top, my objective was to come up with the camera still pointing down, begin to pull the camera back, and as I'm pulling the camera back, I want to pan the camera up at the tip of the totem pole, and when I get about even with it, and I get horizontal, I want to begin my descent down the pole. So that was the objective. It was a, a rather difficult uh, maneuver, and I sometimes will take uh, a dozen attempts or more to try to capture a shot in just the right way. This shot happened on the very first attempt, and I was just amazed. Okay, sound up, please. in here as well. Actually, two time lapses. One's coming up. These time lapses are truly memorable in terms of capturing your memories, and they're not super hard to do. We did a Thank you very much. Thank you. We did a, uh, a lecture on uh, time lapses, and on your TV, uh, you may be able to review that lecture. This is called a pull through here. I actually send the drone through this um, beautiful spot called Teardrop Arch. Start with the drone on the other side of the arch, come back through, and it's called a reveal. And this is a simple pan here. We're going to reveal the monuments in the background just by moving to the right in this particular scenario. This is a place called the Toadstools. And I'm now lining up the drone. I'm getting it ready for this pullback shot that I want to do. And uh, so I'm all set. And now I just can come straight back as I'm uh, videoing, and what it's doing is revealing all of that beautiful imagery as we pass it by. This is just one, one of the many cinematic techniques uh, you can do. This is a place called Arica in Argentina. No, Chile. I believe Chile, I'm sorry. And uh, interesting place, these are all, I think, modern fabricated uh, monuments. Uh, I never got a specific answer on that, but I'm just looking at them, and that's certainly what they look like to me. And uh, I did a number of different uh, fly-throughs there. I'll speak on this after it's done. One person alone on a tropical island for 30 days with no food and no water. With the right gear and a bit of ingenuity, I can survive. All right, so that was a uh, that was a series that I did called the 30-Day Survival Challenge, and uh, it took place in French Polynesia, and I was put on a uh, Polynesian island with no food or no water. I had gear with me. I had hatchets and. I had sleeping bags, and I had a tent, and I had other things like that. 
but I had to survive off of the land. And, uh, you know, what would you imagine the hardest part is? Say again? Yes, absolutely. That's, that was the hardest part. There were coconuts on the island, so that was a fallback, but too many coconuts is not really uh, ideal for you. But getting water, and uh, in this video, I... Uh, I'm a, somewhat of a science buff, and so I go through ways of converting salt water into fresh water and a number of other techniques. It was really a, a super fun. Uh, this is all on YouTube, by the way, if anyone wants to look it up. Uh, this is, I, I call this video Flying with Lions, and uh, it was certainly my first experience. Uh, this was during one of the African safaris on the world trip, and uh, I encountered a pride of young lions. These are probably under two years old, very curious, and they were as curious as I was about how they would react to the drone. And so uh, I'm off in the distance, and I have the drone, and as I move the drone closer to the ground, they get like really, they, they want to <laughs> And, and so the entire time I was shooting this, the thought that was going through my mind is, who's going to be faster, the amazing reflexes of these young lions or my ability to go up as fast as I can with the drone? And uh, so I didn't know what the answer was. I was relatively cautious. Nothing did happen. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a super fun experience, and we had a number of encounters uh, similar to this. You can take a drone. One of the advantages is taking a drone to places that you just can't go to, period. And so I was in Nevada, in a remote area of Nevada, and I was driving by a lake, and I saw what appeared to be a wave in the middle of the lake. And it was this ice wave here, and it was a buckling of ice that had occurred and I could send the drone out there to uh, photograph this in ways that would be absolutely impossible to do if uh, I was constrained to gravity. So we'll go from one extreme to another here. areas that are just so dangerous that a person cannot venture, period. And so to send your eye in the sky, your flying camera, to these locations is such an amazing advantage. This video demonstrates a number of different photographic techniques. Here's a portion of a time lapse here. These are obviously drone uh, footage here, moving the camera in various directions. This is normal still photography, uh, actually video photography with my uh, typical camera. This is an island called Cayman Brack. Here we have some slow motion effect. And if we have time, and we may not have too much more time today, uh, this was shot with a, an action camera, a GoPro, where you can take your cameras into these underwater environments uh, where before it required thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment to accomplish the same thing. Does this scene look familiar to anybody? Hey, there you go, Forrest Gump. All right, good for you. I had run for three years, <laughs> two months, 14 days, and 16 hours.
Does anybody know what he says when he turns around? Quiet. Say it again. Quiet, he's going to say something. Close. The, the, the answer was, I'm done. It's pretty close. I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home now. <laughs> he was a man of few words. Uh, okay, so I was on a, uh, this is a dive boat, a, a beautiful dive boat. I may go into more detail on this in my lecture tomorrow. Uh, this is in uh, Indonesia, and uh, this four-masted, beautiful uh, sailing boat, all made of uh, teak, and I could send the drone out and get amazing shots that would be hard to get uh, any other way. Action cameras. We'll spend just a little bit of time on action cameras while we still have a moment here to go. Uh, back in 2004, the very first action camera hit the world. And it was uh, the GoPro Hero, and we have subsequently had GoPro Hero 1, 2, 3, and I think we're either at 10 or 11 now. And uh, the technology has become just just mind-boggling. I take a GoPro with me everywhere that I go. If any of you saw any of the penguin footage that I uh, showed in prior uh, lectures, the reason that that was so compelling was <coughs> I, one of the techniques that I would use is I would take a GoPro and I would either put it on a tripod or put it on a little uh, uh, gorilla pod, something close to the ground, and I would place it in a spot, and I would just walk away. Okay, now I can control that camera with my phone. I can turn it off and on and, and do uh, some other things. And so when the scene was right, I could turn the camera on. And if I'm standing there, I have some influence on the wildlife that's there because I'm this big mammal. Uh, but if I'm not there, they're going to be more in their uh, authentic uh, habitat and environment and do what they're normally doing. So I, I prefer to do that. So um, all of these cameras uh, come. This is the Hero 2, uh, Hero 3, Hero 4. And uh, this is pictured here, the Hero 10 Black. And here's a quick video on some of the capabilities of what these action cameras can <laughs> Okay, so just amazing uh, devices. Uh, I, when I travel, I really, I never go anywhere without a GoPro. I'm not sponsored by GoPro, so I don't have any benefit in telling you that other than I highly encourage you uh, to make it part of your camera arsenal because they're so versatile. Um, you can take them into environments that you would be afraid to take any other camera. And we'll end... We'll end with this. Do we have five minutes? I think we do, yeah? Um, we'll end with this video here because that's all the time that we have. This was a video I shot in Kolkata, India, and it was in a place called Vrindavan. And when I was in New Delhi, uh, I, when I landed, I had a month to just do whatever I wanted to do. 
And so I asked some of the locals, I said, hey, what's, what's interesting to do? And they said, well, the, the Holy Day Festival is going to happen in Vrindavan on March 6th. I said, really, March 6th, that's my birthday, I'll go. Oh, well, it's Krishna's birthday too, that's why we're celebrating. Oh, okay, serendipitous. Uh, so I went to a cab driver, and have, do I have uh, people who have been to India out there? No? Uh, one guy back there. Indian cab drivers are fearless. And when I say fearless, it means that they have no fear. They, they will move into a space in between cars that a fly could not uh, navigate through. It's just, they're, they're, it's just crazy. They have one hand on the steering wheel and one hand on the horn. It's a constant uh, and noisy uh, adventure. So I asked my first cab driver. Uh, I'm wanting to go to the Holy Day Festival. It was maybe a two-day drive away. And I was going to pay him for his time and hotel and all that. And uh, the guy, his eyes go wide when I say that. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. And so I go to the second and I go to the third guy and I'm getting the same answer. Finally, I find a guy who's willing to uh, take me to Rindvan. Now, I didn't know why they had fear of this, but I'm going to let this video uh, tell you why. It's Holy Day. Sufficiently holied. Yeah. Holy day. And I am in Vrindavan slash Mathura. Happy Holy! And Indians just love the Holy Westerners. Happy Holy! exactly what this uh, celebration entails. It's the color festival, as you might have gathered. It's really quite a blast. Everybody's pretty happy. And at the end of the day, everyone is the same color, which is a pretty cool concept. Happy Holi! Happy Holi! Oh, yeah. All right, so I, I guess everybody's happy on Holy Day. Uh, we're probably going to have That's to a call it a day there. Are we? Yeah. Okay. So the reason I'm showing you this video is any other camera I would bring into that environment. One, I couldn't talk to it. So I just, I had this on a selfie stick. I could hold it out in front of myself. I could have a conversation and narrate uh, what's going on. And it's in an underwater housing. So it's protected from all of that dust and, and all the uh, uh, particulates that could be there. And so it was the right device to have. It was super lightweight and it, created for me a lasting memory of a uh, one of the most wonderful days of my life. All right, folks, that's all the time we have for today. I will continue on probably in our next lecture in talking about some of the action camera and smartphone technology since we ran out for today. Thank you so much for coming.